Well, I, uh, portentous hush has uh, descended on the group, so I guess we should start. Well, I want to uh, welcome everyone and thank you for uh, coming to the uh, lecture uh, this afternoon. Uh, I have a number of uh, individuals and groups to thank, uh, the German department especially, uh, David Welbury, and uh, the writing program, especially Janice Knight and uh, Chiku Reddy. But uh, most of all, uh, this uh, series owes an enormous debt to someone who, uh, if this were a theater event, would be called our angel. So in case you want to know what an angel looks like, Steve Phillips is an angel. <laughs> Steve, stand up. <laughs> Steve, about, it must have been about a year and a half or so ago uh, when um, the university was in a financial crisis. And of course, the first things to go are things like the History and Forms of Lyric uh, series. Uh, I uh, yelled and screamed, and uh, the dean said, well, all right, I can't give you any money, but uh, if you want to write a letter to the visiting committee and see if somebody there will help out with this thing, you can. And I said, all right. And I wrote a letter describing the program, and Steve stepped up and has funded us for, the ne for this year and some of next, I hope. So we owe a real, a genuine debt to Steve, who is also a great lover of English literature and an MA student here uh, many years ago, more years ago than I uh, like to uh, admit. Uh, but not as my, not, uh, my relationship with Steve, long as it is, is nothing compared to my uh, relationship with Roger Greenwald, who I'm delighted to be uh, introducing. Uh, now, um, so Roger uh, grew up in, in New York and attended uh, two wonderful schools that we both attended together, the Bronx High School of Science and uh, the City College of New York. Uh, and uh, Roger and, and, and uh, myself uh, had the privilege of resurrecting and bringing to perfection the City College Literary Magazine, uh, which was called Promethean. And uh, in 1966, we won the contest from the Saturday Review of Literature for the best college literary magazine, which was pretty amazing for City College of New York competing against the Harvard Advocate and everybody else. But the issue that I brought that I will leave here for people to look at was the issue where Roger and I emerged as greatness. <laughs> because, because we had a square binding, a glossy cover, photographs, and 150 pages. And the previous issue was maybe 100 pages, looked like, just looked like nothing. So this is the issue where we emerged. And to show you how long ago this was, this issue is de dedicated to T.S. Eliot, who had just died in 1965. So this is, uh, and it has, for, for those of you who are uh, acquainted with uh, contemporary poetry and uh, writing in general, it has a, a few other interesting features. Uh, it has a number, a poem in it by Lou Warsh, who's a name that some of you know. And the poetry editor was someone named Samuel R. Delaney, who, uh, if any of you are science fiction readers, is a famous science fiction writer now, but then was a friend of ours and a really bad poet, <laughs> who is our poetry editor and has, and has a poem in this issue uh, with the unforgettable title, Two Dogs Near Death. Uh, I am not kidding. You can look it up yourself. <laughs> Uh, I cannot tell you how many hours and hours Roger and I spent putting this thing together and then selling it because the university, the, the college only provided a half of the, uh, the funds we needed. And I won't go into the song and dance that we literally did to um, sell the thing. Anyhow, after this uh, great and illustrious uh, event uh, at uh, CCNY, uh, Roger stayed in New York and uh, got an MA uh, at NYU. Uh, but really, the main thing he was doing that year was working uh, at the St. Mark's and the Bowery Poetry Project uh, in the workshop uh, run by uh, Joel Oppenheimer and Joel Sloman. And uh, in that capacity, he contributed to something modestly known as The World, a New York City literary magazine. This is, this thing is volume one, number one of The World, in which Roger uh, has a poem. And uh, this is volume one, number two, in which I'm happy to say I have a poem. So these are all; these will be uh, on display. <laughs> Treat the world carefully. It's, as you can see, not the uh, 
not bound as nicely as Promethean. <laughs> Didn't have Roger and I to, to do it. Anyhow, um, Roger then uh, went uh, to Toronto uh, in, the, in the late uh, 60s, and many of you will understand why, uh, and uh, eventually got an MA and a PhD uh, at the University of Toronto, and then has had his whole career uh, teaching uh, creative writing, expository writing, uh, uh, prose fiction translation uh, at uh, Innes College at uh, University of Toronto. Uh, Roger is a, a poet himself and uh, has uh, published a, a book called Connecting Flights uh, in 1993 and has a, a, a book manuscript in preparation now that I've had the privilege of reading and has some, some wonderful things in it. Uh, but Roger is perhaps best known as a, a lifelong uh, translator and um, is a, really a major uh, translator of uh, work uh, from uh, Norwegian, uh, Swedish. Uh, what am I forgetting? Danish also? And Danish also. Uh, and um, it looks as if every time he publishes a book of translation, it wins a prize. So uh, one of his... Uh, uh, books of translating Rolf, Jack Rolf is it Jakobsen, uh, won a translation prize, a book was published by Princeton, and he has another uh, collection of Rolf uh, Jakobsen poems published by University of Chicago Press that won another prize. Uh, so, and he'll be giving a translation workshop tomorrow. What I want to say about um, Roger as a, uh, as a critic of poetry uh, is um, somewhat indicated by the title of a couple of his previous talks. Uh, one is called Catching the Music in Scandinavian Poetry, and the other is called High Wire, Balancing Between Tone and Rhythm in Poetry. And Roger seems to be someone who uh, understands that, that it's really important that poetry not be prose, that even if it's prose poetry, that it not be prose. And uh, I remember having many discussions with Roger about, well, is this thing actually a poem? It's lineated, but is it actually a poem? And Roger insists that the ear is quite crucial in, um, in uh, poetry and is really devoted to the importance of technique, although he swears to me earlier today that he cares about meaning also, but I know he's lying. Uh, so I, I was not at all surprised that he chose to uh, lecture to us today on something very uh, internal to uh, lyric poetry time in poetic forms, order, pace, and duration. So it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce my very old friend of almost 50 years, Roger Greenwald. Uh, thanks very much, Richard, for your very gracious uh, introduction, a very humorous one. Uh, the title of my poetry book is connecting flight in the singular. So many people had made that um, error when they introduced me that I eventually wrote a poem called S's. I think it started, some say the world will end in fire, others say in S's or in S. In any case, um, I have my own thank yous to make, not only to Steve Phillips to, for sponsoring this series, but especially to Kate Soto of the um, <clears throat> Committee on Creative Writing and Jen Nafziger, who's over there, for taking care of all the practical arrangements. And there are many before something like this can happen. <clears throat> Thanks. <clears throat> I want to talk about how time manifests itself in poems, particularly in lyric poems other than as an explicit subject. In other words, I want to consider how time plays various roles in the form of the poems. This is a large topic, so I've chosen three aspects of it, leaving out almost entirely the complex matter of verb tense. And even so, I must be sketchy about order and duration so I can offer some detail about pace. In looking at examples, I will take the opportunity to introduce you to some poets whom you may not be familiar with. And I'll also comment on some issues that order, pace, and duration raise for translators. 
The texts of most of the poems I will quote from, as well as a list of relevant secondary readings, will be available as a handout at the end of the talk. I'll begin with two caveats. First caveat, when I speak of time in poems, I do not, of course, mean clock time or any sort of scientific time, but rather a simulacrum of time that, using Suzanne Langer's term for the primary illusion created by music, one could call virtual time. And in the reader, I mean the experience of that simulacrum that one can call subjective time. In Langer's theory, virtual time is not the primary illusion created by literary genres. Lyric poetry creates virtual memory. Narrative poetry and prose create virtual history. And drama creates virtual destiny. To make matters more difficult, Langer points out, it is the peculiar habit of the lyric poet to create, quote, a sense of concrete reality from which the time element has been canceled out, leaving a platonic sense of eternity. This is so, she says, because, quote, contemplation is the substance of the lyric, and the natural tense of contemplation is the present. Ideas are timeless. In a lyric, they are not said to have occurred, but are virtually occurring. The relations that hold them together are timeless, too. The whole creation in a lyric is an awareness of a subjective experience, and the tense of subjectivity is the timeless present. Lyric writing is a specialized technique that constructs an impression or an idea as something experienced in a sort of eternal present." End quote. None of this means, however, that temporal effects are absent in lyric poetry. Langer herself is brilliant, as always, in analyzing such effects. My second caveat arises from my mention of music. I think that to experience the temporal effect of poetry, especially those effects that fall under pace, one must be able to hear the poem in the mind's ear, even though the sounds of poetry are not music, and even though the voice unrolling in time that one hears is an illusion of a human voice. The notion of the voice unrolling in time is part of a description by Joseph Frank of the ambition of those who would create spatial form in literature, quote, to undermine the inherent consecutiveness of language, frustrating the reader's normal expectation of a sequence, and forcing him to perceive the elements of the poem as juxtaposed in space rather than unrolling in time." End quote. Frank is quoted in a brief but valuable lecture by Monroe K. Spears called Space Against Time in Modern Poetry. After citing the common division of poets into those with visual imaginations and those with auditory imaginations, Spears proposes with qualifications that I must elide here. That, quote, most poets show a marked affinity for one of the other major arts and tend to draw images from it and to think in terms of analogies with it. Music and painting are the two arts most significant in this way. And most poets can be classified without much difficulty as either painting or music poets. Moreover, most poets can also be classified according to whether they conceive of the poem as primarily an object in space or an event in time. We expect the three categories to be related somewhat as follows. Poets whose imagination is visual will be painting poets and will think in terms of space, while auditory poets will display an affinity to music and will think in terms of time." End quote. At first, Spears seems to suggest that the modern period brought with it a radical disruption of this polarity. But soon enough, it appears that one of the period's large concerns was, quote, to experiment with the possibility of escaping from the 19th century time obsession through attempting what has later been called spatial form, and that nonetheless, some of the major modern poets were time poets, notably Eliot, 
Hound, and Auden. My own impression is that although some traditional expectations about sequence can be disrupted, the inherent consecutiveness of language is very difficult to get around. So even the most visual poem will create some sort of voice unrolling in time. And ironically, typographical arrangements in the space of the page, as employed by E.E. E. Cummings or by the highly visual William Carlos Williams, in fact, function as a sort of musical notation for the inner voice. Further, I strongly suspect that although some effects may have been invented or at least become more frequent as poetry itself has unrolled through the centuries, and although some older effects have fallen into disuse or turn up only rarely, the means by which almost all of the temporal manifestations that concern me are achieved have probably been with us since the Renaissance, if not earlier. Let me now turn to those manifestations. The first one is order. I've chosen this term to indicate the sequence in which various elements are arranged in poems. I've avoided chronology because it implies an order determined by the order of events and proceeding from earliest to latest. And I've avoided sequence because it easily suggests chronological order or logical order or some other arrangement in which the disposition of the elements can be predicted on the basis of a single criterion. Note that order may shape or influence aspects of form that I will come to later under pace. We can ask some basic questions about the order of elements in a poem. For example, do they have a direction, and if so, what sort? Forward or backward or both? Linear, circular, triangulating from several temporal points of view? Or is there a movement by association, as in a dream, or a daydream order in which time can loop back or rewind and play out again with different outcomes? A further question, does the poem have a number of discrete threads, whether of argument or event, perhaps two or even three of them intertwined? Even a series of interruptions for comments could constitute a thread of its own. By way of brief illustration, consider Blake's well-known poem, Ah, Sunflower. Ah, sunflower, weary of time, who countest to the steps of the sun, seeking after that sweet golden clime where the traveler's journey is done, where the youth pined away with desire and the pale virgin shrouded in snow arise from their graves and aspire where my sunflower wishes to go. The whole poem is a sentence fragment and is wonderfully circular. Blake constructs a rhetorical loop that seems to cancel out what little elapsed time this non-sentence may have allowed to slip in. Thus he evokes both the timelessness of the sweet golden clime and the timelessness of the sunflower's doomed attempt to escape time. In this poem, time is an explicit subject, but I hope it is clear that the main means by which temporal effects are created in the form are syntax and repetition. Here is part of a poem by the Norwegian poet and novelist Tarja Vesos, Spur, or The Footprints. The Footprints. On the secluded beach, there's no one now. The mountains above are scorched. An arc of sand, bitterly abandoned, covered by one person's tracks. Abandoned, deserted after a harrowing wait. The mountains above are scorched. Someone has been here and paced and paced, but no one came across this lake. It is typical of one, of what one might call Vesos's triangulating approach to time in his poems, that footprints begins in the moment soon after the footprints were made, then moves to their making in a before that never yielded an event. A poem that displays the intertwining of two temporal threads, and indeed takes the contrast between them as its subject is Paul Helga Haugen's MD 
after a three-line opening that says of the present moment, this could have been long ago. There is a blank line, then a second longer section, and after another blank line, a seven-line closing. I'll read the whole poem. MD. When you bend your neck that way under the lamp, I know this could have been long ago. The flickering screen expands, the raster jumps, the scanning lines billow out, make room for other pictures, for a brittle music and the acrid taste of time. The room is filled from all sides with cries of newborns and the stinging smoke of huge fires, backs under the scourge, hurried embraces, and a light that burns late into the night. A soft neck bent in the light, hair flooding out to the dark of a night in a year that's written with just two letters, MD, and a small shoe that slips off a slender foot, fabric softly falling and smoothed aside carefully in the gleam from a guttering lamp. The year MD versus my 1985 in neutral offset and empty phrases on junk mail brochures someone has thrown away, they swell up in the spring rain in the same wet mist draped over people's bodies underway this evening, the same thirst, spring of MD, spring now. Here we can see that although the setting of a poem in a particular time is not itself an aspect of form, the intertwining of two or more time periods in one poem will often involve issues of form because the need to switch from one to another or back and forth will affect some structural elements such as transitions. In MD, the flickering television screen gives way to the light cast by huge fires and the gleam from a guttering lamp. Incidentally, a biographical footnote, perhaps Haugen was attracted to the year 1500 in particular because he holds the MD degree, although he never did practice as a physician. The challenge for a translator in a poem like MD is to ensure that the almost cinematic dissolve works as smoothly in the target language as in the Norwegian poem. And I might expand on that remark by saying that it was a general challenge for me to learn to make English poetry that works as Haugen's does, mainly through visual images, juxtaposition, and a focus on space and light, since I am a poet who works mainly through voice. Perhaps that's why I am so fond of Haugen's book, Stone Fences. It contains more voices than a visually oriented reader may at first detect. My own poem, An Old Story, like M.D., but written much earlier, I should point out, moves back and forth between a modern present and the medieval past of early music and Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. It opens with people in the present listening to early music, music that brings the idea of rest into the mind of the speaker, and that by association leads him to restless former lives the story in the Gawain poem. Again, I'll read the whole poem, an old story. Casually secret, his lady's ankle under her long gown, under my fingers, her blood rushing back. The idea of rest walks up, takes hold of me, and puts my heart in a cup. Gone so long, the world no longer contained it. The old music that surcease revived as reminders of restless former lives in years will be the same. Gawain wanders through the forest. It is cold and the small birds shiver in the branches. He must cross rivers, endure hardships too many to name. The idea of rest appears. Stay with me, says the lady. It is cold and the small birds shiver in the branches. The bed is empty, in years will be the same. 
Gawain resists the idea of rest the world barely contained except for the music, praise for life of years for which the word was winter's then. In the last part, you can hear the alternation between the present tense in which the old story is told, Gawain resists praise, and the past tense that indicates present thoughts about the medieval world in which the Gawain poem was both written and set, the idea of rest the world barely contained, years for which the word was winters then. My second manifestation of time after order is pace. Pace within the poetic line, horizontal pace, has received so much attention in the critical literature and is such a common topic in almost every handbook published about poetry that I'm sure I need only refer to some aspects of this topic or to some of the standard examples to evoke nods of recognition. Long lines are said to move fast and short lines slowly often true historically, but sometimes false in the 20th century. Some meters plod while others gallop, and in the rhythms laid over those meters, the density of stresses, the placement of caesuras, the use of masculine or feminine line endings, and the patterns of long and short vowels are all shown to affect the perception of speed. Robert Pinsky in The Sounds of Poetry, by the way, is unusual in discussing the length of syllables not just of vowels. Kenneth Burke is even more unusual in examining the musical effects of patterns in families of related consonants. Yet it is worth noting that counting alone can never tell us the effect of a line or passage. For the content, as much as the punctuation or absence of it, always cues us about how to handle the rhythm. Try reading this line slowly and seriously I am the very model of a modern major general. Yet in Hopkins, heavy alliteration and internal rhyme are to be found in lines that force us to hear them as quite slow, even long lines. The difference lies in Hopkins's convoluted and compressed syntax and in the punctuation that goes along with it. In contrast to horizontal pace, vertical pace, the speed at which the poem moves down the page has received much less attention as far as I'm aware. Comments on end stopping of lines as against enjambment, common in traditional treatments of poetry, especially of older formal poetry, have some implications for downward movement, but these implications are rarely explored. Here are two contrasting poems by Rolf Jakobsen. Wintertime, Signs of Winter, a poem of long, slow lines, most of which end with a period, and his Ventetid, Waiting Time, a poem of short, fast lines that has no punctuation at all before the final period. Signs of Winter. Frost clenches its fists and tries to shatter the roads. The aspen leaves die with formaldehyde on their breath. The glaciers drag themselves step by step across the heads of valleys, bottom heavy and winded, a meter every thousand years. The clouds are streaked with fatigue, warm their fingers on a dark red sun. The birds have left their empty tree, their trees empty and gone away defeated. Your tongue curls back on your palate. Thought locks its door. Waiting time. Some stand out in the sun and wait. Others wait at gas stations. Cafes are good to wait in. You can sit and think about what can happen if what you're afraid of, hope for, or indifferent to doesn't happen. At any rate, waiting time in the sick bed on the Oslo housing list or in the ticket line, the old age home. But mostly we wait for what never happens or happens every day, unimportant boy or girl, or for death the long distance call and the mailman, but mostly what gladdens the little you keep hidden in your hand. Mostly for what gladdens the little you keep hidden in your hand, the little you hold hidden carefully in one hand. We spend a lot of time waiting, says this poem's words, and its form says 
that time does not wait. The analyses that most frequently consider the effect of form on how whole poems move are critical treatments, as distinct from mere descriptions, of stanzaic form. Suzanne Langer points out how in Elizabethan poetry, one or two beat lines that halt, quote, the flow of a stanza, which then continues with a slowed cadence, are used for several purposes. And Paul Fussell, in discussing stanzaic forms, touches often on the structure and therefore on the pace of whole poems. In American poetry, the use of traditional stanzas virtually disappeared in the modern period, and their revival by so-called new formalists was largely an academic exercise. In the UK, the tradition perhaps retains somewhat stronger vital signs. Even so, one can generalize about a striking difference between Renaissance and modern poetry. Fussell observes, quote, there would seem to be something about the Renaissance poet's contemplation of human mortality that urges him to his most sensitive perceptions of the weight of stanzaic elements, end quote. And yet, quite aside from surviving uses of traditional stanzas, there are modern poems in which there are stanzas of a sort, whether these be like the three parts of Haugen's MD, irregular units that nonetheless correspond to divisions of time and thought, or regular groups of lines in nonce forms, like the five line stanzas in Tarja Vesos' poem, Eit Ur am Hausten, A Word in the Fall, which I have changed to four line stanzas because English would not support some of the short lines that an unpadded translation would have yielded. Here are the first two stanzas. The poem has four in all. A word in the fall. Then it came to September. Became glowing September. Still and clear between the mountains and clear overhead. Huge clear spaces were out wandering and inside them September's bell called us to the toil of labor. You can feel the deliberate pace. The poem moves forward by a process of picking up stitches. No sooner does a line introduce an image or thought than there is a pause in which the poet seems to consider what he's just said before offering a further thought on it, a deeper thought, one that moves the poem forward a step so it can find out where it's going. First September, then glowing September, first clear between the mountains, then clear overhead. One could regard this as afterthought or mere verbal elaboration, but I think not. What happens in the stanza break? After it, clear appears for a third time, but now the clear spaces are huge, suggesting a contrast with the size of the observing humans, and the spaces are animated out wandering as if they were giants. The implied contrast is next made explicit as inside contrasts with out, and the people are called to labor under the freely wandering spaces. So in the stanza break, the poet has come upon the contrast he will reveal in the second stanza. The exhilaration of September's weather will bring with it the toil of the harvest. The whole poem moves in this fashion which resembles that of biblical exegesis, each point examined, re-examined, taken further. We went to earth, to everyone's earth. We were shy of calling her what she was for us. As Fussell acutely remarks, quote, the white space between stanzas means something. If nothing is conceived to be taking place within it, if no kind of silent pressure or advance or, reconsider or reconsideration or illumination or perception seems to be going on in that white space, the reader has a legitimate question to ask. Why is that white space there and what am I supposed to do with it?" End quote. As I have suggested, many factors create the vertical pace of a poem. The length and speed of the line units, the nature of the line breaks, the degree of convolution in the syntax, stanzaic structure, if there is any. <clears throat> it seems to me that if there is one innovation in pacing that is characteristically modern, 
it is the achievement of greater speed, or at least of uninterrupted flow in the vertical movement of poems. Many of you probably know a textbook example of very fast pace, such as E.E. E. E. Cummings' amusable, amusing satirical poem, next to, of course, God, whose breathless, unpunctuated rush is amazingly poured into sonnet form. Or all you need do is think of the opening of a poem of a very different tone and purpose, <clears throat> Ginsburg's How, the long speeding lines, starving, hysterical, naked, without commas, so each adjective seems to modify the next as much as it modifies an earlier noun. Uninterrupted downward flow is not the same thing as speed, of course. The flow can move at different speeds, but we may, stretching the term a bit, regard uninterruptedness itself as a sort of pace, or anyway, a sort of gait. Like speed, flow can be achieved by various means and used for various ends. Joel Oppenheimer often wrote in short lines that keep falling, each one tumbling over its own right edge into the next line, so that the poems seem to make their way into some place where the poet may not have wanted to go, but had the courage to follow them. Here is one poem from his very brave book, The Woman Poems. It's called Screaming Poem. The woman inside me does not murmur, she screams. It has been so ever since I gave up breast for bottle, the geometry of shapes for the algebra of numbers. This woman claws at my innards, sits patiently waiting, beats in my head, wakes up when I sleep, occasionally relents, opening herself before me. I don't know what to do when that happens, draw back, look for the solace of straight lines, draw plans all night on my checkered graph paper, plan out the rational life of a man, and make no room for magics. I am torn by the ravening screams echoing over and over. Love, love, love. Here with some ellipses are the opening and the ending of a very different screaming poem by Jacques Vera, Swedish poet, written in long lines that zigzag quickly down the page. I jumped up, the bed was screaming, the rugs, the lamp, the piles of newspapers, the curtains were screaming, my slippers, I opened the screaming window, all the names were screaming from the telephone book on the table in front of me, the table was screaming, what should I do? And the ending, I banged my screaming head against the walls that only screamed louder, I scratched my screaming face, my nails screamed, my blood screamed and ran down into my screaming eyes. Everything was screaming, everything. The whole world was screaming, speak for us who cannot speak. To take one more case, John Ashbery's poetry is often written in long, complex sentences that can be taken in silently at one go, but cannot be read aloud in one breath without increasing speed. This confirms the rightness of one of Langer's many sharp perceptions, for although reading so as to hear a voice internally imposes a certain limit on the speed of silent reading, that speed, as Langer points out, is nonetheless more rapid than the speed of reading aloud. For reasons that I won't lay out here, Langer insists that the voice of the poem is best heard within the silent reader, and I agree. All of the mechanisms of pacing, whether fast or slow, that I have referred to can be observed in Shakespeare, in poetry of our own day, and probably in every period in between, though as I've suggested, I think a case can be made that in the 20th century, devices that convey ceaselessness, breathlessness, and speed were developed in new ways and became more common, more prominent. Both horizontal and vertical pacing are of great importance to the translator and often highly challenging as well. They are important because they are aspects of the poem's voice and is the, it is the nuances of the voice that convey tone and with it emotional import. Translators must first of all make lines that work and line breaks that work. In Rolf Jakobsen's poem, Shentiai Dai, Did I Know You, 
a line break in the middle of the word hal tenkta, half thought, produces a line that starts tenkta tanker, thought, thoughts, half thought, thoughts. That works in Norwegian, tank to tanker, but thought, thoughts does not work in English. So I had to move the line break. Did I know you? Did I know you, really? Things you never quite said or we let lie. Half thought, thoughts, a shadow that passed over your face, something in your eyes. No, I don't want to believe that, but it comes back. Night has no sounds. Only strange thoughts, words that rise up from my sleep. Did I know you? Translators must maintain the pace of the source poem. The first and last stanzas of Jakobsen's Grunman, or Green Man, must be able to go even faster than Gilbert and Sullivan, while the deliberately paced short lines of Paul Helga Haugen's Steinjarde, Stone Fences, must somehow be prevented, in spite of their lack of punctuation, from zipping by in English like Oppenheimer's lines. This is just the beginning, the first stanza of Green Man. Go, says the green man in the traffic light to all the pant legs, shopping bags, baby buggies, bifocals, and braziers. Get a move on, because now it's urgent for the world, for the West, for the East, for wider markets, wine imports, warranty deadlines, wealth of nations, water pollution, and woof, woof. Get a move on. Come on over, because now. Then comes the red light. Stop. Second stanza is very slow. Now here's Haugen's poem, Stone Fences in its entirety. Stone fences. It was the stone fences that bound the world together. Ribs stretching from the river to the mountain, warm to sit on in the summer evening. Stones wedged in against each other with unending patience, time, and strong hands. The hay fields flush against the wall fully ripe and ready for the scythe, lush pasture against stone. That was how we began to see that it is possible to change the world. The old people cut every last stalk and cleaned up with their rakes. Afterward, they rested, leaned on the stone as against an old friend's back. They are still there above the stone lines in the landscape hands invisible in the air, like the beating of wings, if you dare to come close. These are the stones of toil. This is history's handwriting. Translators must also maintain the downward movement or flow, especially when long syntactical structures are used. In Jacques Verb's poems from Tieden i Malmö på jorden, the time in Malmö on the earth, this is relatively easy to do, since the flow is achieved mainly by the stringing together with commas of fairly simple sentences, whose interwoven themes and varied diction nonetheless produce poems of considerable complexity. A poem like Lars Porcel's Vita di Gesualdo, The Life of Gesualdo, on the other hand, demands the careful deployment of syntactical resources. Here is its first sentence, as I have engineered it in my translation. Vita di Gesualdo. The winter of 1593, with 90 servants in his party and 300 trunks of luggage, transported by 24 mules, with musicians more numerous than the strings of a harp, among them the guitarist Filamarino and Scipione Falla, the greatest singer of his era. Having arranged in cold blood and with premeditation, for he, like all of Venosa, had long known of their liaison, the murder of his wife, Dona Maria Davalos, and her young lover, and her lover, the young Duke of Andria, who were caught in flagrante. And with all Venosa talking, 
not of crime passionnel, but of murder, because Donna Maria was highly regarded and kind to the people. The prince and duke, lord and count, Don Carlo Gesualdo, ruler of Venosa, left his embittered town to travel to Ferrara and his new bride, the fat but fertile Leonora d'Este. But of course, above all, to listen to the music being played at the court of Ferrara, cannons and madrigals by Josquin, Obrecht, Brummel, Palestrina, Di Lasso, Cipriano, Marenzio, and to play the lute with his slender blood-stained hand for at least two hours a day and compose madrigals with most refined polyphony and previously unheard dissonances. To move to more esoteric translation issues, translators must even consider the intrinsic speed of source and target languages. Norwegian, in general, has denser patterns of stresses and half stresses than English does, probably because of its compound nouns. And of Norwegian's two written norms, which are a much longer story than I can tell you here, Nynorsk is somewhat slower than Bukmol and often much slower than English. Diphthongs and dense consonant clusters tend to give one more to chew on in Nynorsk. Finally, printing the source text on facing pages of a book slows down the reader. That is one reason I chose to have the Ninos text opposite the English versions in Haugen's Stone Fences, but to publish Verup's The Time in Malma on the Earth in English only, so that there would be nothing to draw the reader's eye away from the continuous downward movement of the poem. Having touched on those translation issues, I can now turn to my third and final manifestation of time in poetry, duration. I should state immediately that I consider so-called durational realism to rest on a fundamental error, the failure to realize that all time in art forms is virtual time. My labels for types of duration will be relative measures within virtual frameworks. Many durational effects are simply the result of the effects of order and pace that I've already outlined, but there are additional durational effects that arise from the relation of syntactical and other structures to events in the poem. Perhaps the most obvious is elision, a sort of jump cut, which makes clear that an event has happened or time has elapsed while the poem was silent, for example, in the break between stanzas. In contraction, events that stretch over a longer period transpire in a moment or an instant in the poem, that is, quickly relative to the rate in the rest of the poem. The opposite of contraction is dilation. The poem seems to stretch out a short interval, perhaps only a few seconds of action or thought. The purpose of such dilation may be to create suspense, but it may also be to render the subjective experience that time has been strangely slowed down. James Dickey's poem, The Bee, does both of these. As the speaker's son, stung by a bee, runs in panic toward a heavily trafficked highway, the speaker, summoning all his strength and old college football training to outrace the boy, conjures up his coach and all his urgings while we, late, wait, while we wait to learn the outcome. Part of the speaker's life passes before him, not in the face of his own possible death, but in the face of his sons. <clears throat> Some of the chief mechanisms by which dilation can be created are suggested by these questions. How many lines are spent on the brief moment? How does the syntax suspend completion of the action? Such suspension can be observed in countless poems. One powerful one that comes to mind is Dylan Thomas's A Refusal to Mourn the Death by Fire of a Child in London. Devices of dilation can be equivalent to melisma in music if they are ornamental or repetitive or incantatory. For example, the stringing of epithets in Homer or in Anglo-Saxon poetry 
or Lars Forsell's recitation of Giswaldo's multiple titles. But in Whitman, the long strings of participial and gerund phrases often indicate not a particular expanse of time, but the abundance of it, the poet's expansiveness, leisure, willingness to let time pass as it will. In Rolf Jakobsen's poem, Pig Throw of Winter, Barbed Wire Winter, which describes the poet's wedding in occupied Norway in 1940, there is not so much dilation as a kind of opening up of time in the last line. Here are the last four lines in Norwegian and English. Da vi har lagt oss om kvällen, grein vi en skvett, begge to. Gud vet hvorfor. Og så begynte det lange live. When we got in bed that night, we cried a dab, both of us. God knows why. And then the long life began. Although the English must end with the verb rather than with the long life, it is a verb that opens out into time, I think. And although the rhythmic structure of the last line must also be different in English, it may nonetheless create an effect that is suitable, even if not quite equivalent. O so begynte de lange live, and then the long life began. And there my longish lecture ends. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to take any questions or comments. Someone has to start, and then it starts rolling, right? My fiercest critic is raising his hand here. Let's start with Kelly uh, Austin. No, no, I was just starting. I was afraid nobody else was going to say anything. Oh, nice. <laughs> Go ahead, Kelly. Um, no, I was just, I'm very interested in um, the repetition of the mother and the son. Mm -hmm. The repetition of must in your talk. The translator must, the translator must. Yes. And um, I was wondering about your relation to fidelity and, you know, and the original, uh, you know, in relation to the, uh, the, the target language and, and that poem. I, I, mean, I Because I, you know, as, as you read that, the, the last part, um, I was, I was thinking, you, you know, you said, well, the, the verb must go at the end of that, that no, it doesn't, <laughs> then began the long life, you know, and that would be a way to put long life at the end of that line. Um, and I, I, I just think, I was just, so that was one of the, what I, I was trying to pay attention to the, the musts. Yes. And, 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 and think um, also about, you know, that possibility of creativity and, and, and difference. Okay. Between um, I, I think I have a number of things to say in response. Yeah, it's a big question. <laughs> well, it, it really has uh, three aspects. I think that when I said, although the verb must, uh, although the English must end with the verb, um, of course I didn't mean it was impossible to write it otherwise. I meant that in my judgment, I didn't want to invert the line. Um, and likewise, must in the rest of my talk was a kind of shorthand. <clears throat> what I meant was that um, most translators uh, feel some obligation to render the um, tone of the poem and the emotional import of the poem. I think they should feel that obligation. And when I say translators, I mean people making things that I would call translations, which are not um, their own poems built on the pretext of some source text. Um, we, many of us, have different ways of approaching translation and different ways of working. I was speaking for myself. I feel a strong obligation to try to capture the, the music, as my other title uh, indicated in the poem, or make some kind of equivalent music. But I think your, 
your right to um, to question the the word, um, and that I was perhaps um, <clears throat> speaking more about the obligation that I feel than trying to dictate a particular method or um, particular element. But I think that if you read translations where the translator has not conveyed these aspects of the poem, you generally feel that uh, something is missing. Yes? Um, uh, as you were speaking, I was thinking about what corresponds and what doesn't correspond to the narratological study of fictional prose. Um, in fiction, pacing is measured according to how, uh, whether the time it takes to read a paragraph is longer than, shorter than, or identical to the time it takes for the thing to happen. So um, time is elastic in narrative, in, uh, but, but the reader's always aware of the sense, in, in traditional prose narrative, sense of what's actually happening within the story itself around which the discourse either shrinks or expands. I'm just curious what you'll say about this question. In some of the poems you're talking about, there is a story. But some of them are, as you say, contemplative. So is there another kind of pacing that has to do with, that, has to, that corresponds to what I'm talking about in fiction, which is the narrative events that are the ground upon which then the uh, the discourse either expands or contracts or remains faithful second by second. It seems like that, that base has kind of dropped out in lyric poetry. I think that base has kind of dropped out in lyric poetry. I mean, in a narrative, purely narrative poem, you could ask the same question and apply the same measure. I think that one way of thinking of it is to say, well, what if the lyric poem is an utterance in which the narrative elements do not narrate in the same way that prose fiction narrates, that they are an utterance about events rather than really a narration of events. Because you're, you've got a, a narrative element inside a lyric framework. And the same question sometimes arises about um, declarative statements or uh, ideas in, in lyric poems. And I think uh, it's widely recognized that the poem is not a substitute for an essay, and the, uh, the argument presented by the ideas isn't necessarily always logical or consistent. And yet, the utterance of a certain idea in a certain context conveys not only the thought, but the emotion attendant upon having that idea at that moment and saying that idea at that moment in relation to what comes before it and what comes after it. So I think it's, uh, it would be difficult to apply that kind of measure to lyric poems. Uh, well, I have a question which is slightly related to that, which is about variability in speed as it is governed and deliberately introduced by the poet within a particular poem. And I come from a class today on, on Collins' Ode on the Poetical Character, which is a very good thing for looking at this, because it seems to me that the variations within that text are determined by variations between line, sentence, and overall design. And indeed, we tested this. What we did first was to read the poem through as a group, which emphasized line and was relatively slow. Then we read the poem by sentence through intonational contour of the sentence, of the full sentence, and it significantly speeded up. What we didn't get to would have been the third way of reading it, which is to understand that the central section of the poem represents a certain urbanity against a grandiose little tonic ending, which would mean you would have to speed up the second section mm -hmm. as opposed to the third section. Uh -huh. So maybe it was just the exigencies of a of what was actually quite a compact talk rather than a long one, that you weren't able to go into the way in which poets handle differing time registers within the same poetic um, artifact, within the same poem. I think that uh, when I said that counting will never reveal the pace, that's what I was getting at, that the, the content is going to cue you 
to how to read the poem. And in the example that you raise, of course, uh, it's, it's clear that if you have a different conception of what the poem is doing and how the poem is built, and you read it aloud, you're going to read it differently from someone else. Every reading aloud is an interpretation, and every translation is an interpretation. And so um, when you read multiple translations of the same text, you can often infer what the translator thought was going on in the poem, the underlying structure of the imagery, um, the tone. It can be radically different in different translations. And uh, I think that the, the aspects you're talking about um, depend on a thorough analysis of the source text. And it's said that the translator's way of reading is one of the deepest ways of reading there is because the translator is usually trying to not only understand the structure and the content, but how the sound patterns and so on relate to them. And uh, you know, rather than paying attention to one or another element that a critic may prefer to emphasize or may have as his special interest, the translator has to more or less take in all the parts in their relation and how they come together to make the, the poem work. I don't know if I answered your question. Um, well, almost. I mean, I, I think that was wasn't quite clear enough in that most of the, I think all of the poems that you discussed, with the exception of the, of the stop sign poem, mm -hmm. where there was a change of pace, uh, refer to lyric poems as though there were overall governing questions for each poem. Oh, oh. Particularly. Uh -huh. And I was suggesting that there are certain poems yes. where there is great finesse in in joining the two different species. And in the example I gave, that's also determined by, for example, some widely delayed, some greatly delayed rhyme words, uh -huh. which has, has a powerful right. swing. Yes, yeah, so I, I, absolutely. I agree entirely. I mean, there's no reason to think that each poem has one uniform pace. Um, I don't know if this is quite related to what you're talking about, but it, I was thinking about it. Uh, an example that Jonathan Collard uses in Structuralist Poetics, uh, where he talks about a, a newspaper clipping that's been turned into a poem. I think it comes from Kramas. Uh, but, you know, it goes something like, yesterday on the A7, an automobile traveling at 60 miles per hour crashed into a plane tree. Its four occupants were killed. And so what happens when you break that up and you get yesterday on the A7 is one line, suddenly the meaning of yesterday changes. Uh, it's now become... Uh, all our yesterdays, uh, a sort of eternal yesterday, and that seems to be a structural effect of, of, um, of you know, the conventions of lyric poetry itself. Um, and, you know, he tracks a lot of other changes in it, too. I mean, the other interesting thing is, is that it becomes the author's yesterday, I mean, it becomes the, um, the voice of someone contemplating mm -hmm. yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, uh, and since it is, you know, originally a newspaper clipping, I mean, it's Clear that those, you know, I mean, there is no author in that in that sense. I mean, these seem to be just effects that uh, that occur because of the um, because of the line breaks. Um, and I was just wondering whether that had anything to do with, you know, I mean, here we're talking about in a sense narrated time in the poem, uh, but a narrated time that becomes a kind of a, that becomes eternalized through the very fact of turning it into a poem. Well, obviously, the, the, the change in uh, visual form and the context changes the way in which the reader takes those words or that sentence. I think that it's easier to impose new effects through line breaks than it is to make line units out of that kind of found language. I think, in general, um, in workshops, students often get the hang of line breaks and making something happen across the line break. But the question of, yes, but is this line a line, the whole line, does it have some kind of rhythmic tension or something that makes it a line, is a much more difficult question. And it's difficult for poets, and we struggle with it forever. <laughs> and, um, and this is one of the 
uh, questions involved um, in the kinds of debate that Richard referred to in his introduction where you're asking yourself, is this poetry or is this uh, broken prose? Um, and uh, different people will answer differently in different instances because not everybody has the same ear. So we were trusting your reading, but I started imagining those poems as you know unlineated blocks of text or as a single mm -hmm. long line of text. Mm -hmm. And it seemed that in any, in either case, let's say you printed all of these poems as a single long line uh, with the same punctuation they have or no punctuation if they don't have, there is there already lots of clues about pacing, right? Um, totally separate from the lineation. Yes. Right? The, the, the sentences carry um, conventional pacing. Right? The, I mean, in other words, one of the major building blocks of pacing in really all literature is the pace of certain words as spoken in the language, the pace of certain sentences, the rhythms of ordinary speech, and also the conventions of, sort of how sentences are built, right? Yes. Um, and so then I'm wondering, um, it, is vertical pace just making visually manifest something that's already there in these poems, if they're breaking up a poem into very short lines? or um, is there a retention between the internal, or what you might call the intrinsic pace of a given set of words and the lineation? Or, right, because if, if it's all intrinsic to the language, then I'm not sure there's a reason to call it vertical pace, because the same thing could happen in a horizontal space. I don't think it is intrinsic in okay. the language. I, I think that it's interesting, for example, in trying to answer the question, is this poem poetry, the, the lines work, or is it broken prose? If you, in fact, print out the poem as a block of prose, and you hand it to someone and say, what do you think? I mean, is this, um, is this poetry written out as prose, or is this prose? And there are some poems in which you will hear immediately uh, you know, there may be rhymes and there may be um, heavy cadences, and you will hear immediately that there are units and that you might be able to even guess maybe where you would break this. There are others, especially these short lined unpunctuated poems, where I think if you printed it out <clears throat> as a block of text, uh, you know, like Haugen's Stone Fences, um, that it would you could think, you might think it was prose, and it would go faster as prose. And I think the line breaks are instructing you uh, that he wants you to heft each, uh, each line like a little stone in your hand and watch what he's going to add with the next phrase. So I understand your point, and um, it, it's undeniable that some words are faster to say than others, and, and that a sentence with no punctuation is going to be much faster than a sentence that's littered with commas. But I do think the um, um, presentation visually in line units has something to say about how it goes. Of course, yeah, I didn't mean to imply that lineation doesn't have an effect on the right. way the poem's read, but rather that there's this other thing happening in addition to that that might not map to horizontal or vertical. Well, it's going to contribute to it in one way or the other because the poem is written in language and the poet has only those materials to work with. Obviously, there's word choice that's involved and uh, it's, uh, it's curious to, to look at length of syllables in English poetry since we scan it by stress, and when people write, I think they usually don't think consciously about length, but the ear is at work. So, did you have a question? Well, it was more of a thing that occurred to me to think about as we were talking. I'm trying to think about it more in light of these last questions. I was thinking, yeah. since you mentioned early music, I was thinking about you know, that paratense. Yes, that's highly melismatic music. Yeah. Single, it's a One syllable stretch out for. Yeah, the single 
word, right? I mean, the, yeah. there's one that's just the word "mores," right? And it lasts for about like, a couple of minutes, yeah. or something like that. And I was just thinking about that as a, as I guess, a way of thinking about the difference between music and poetry, right? I mean, thinking about the kinds of things that music can do to language, as opposed to the kinds of things that poetry. So I was struck by what you said about Plague, you know, that, that poem being a sentence fragment, yet we still recognize that as a poem, right? So the sentence isn't, isn't any kind of limit, right? But mm -hmm. the, perhaps the word is, right? So is that, <laughs> I said it wasn't a question, it's it well, just a kind of, you know, a set of reflections. Well, I mean, unless you're doing sound poetry, yeah. uh, words have denotations as well as sounds and connotations. So you're in a fundamentally different medium from music. And, you know, I said that in a way you, can, you could consider the stringing of epithets as a sort of melisma in the sense that the sentence is suspended while you are reciting the various either names or attributes of the subject and eventually you will get to a verb. So, I mean, that suspends the, the motion the way Peritan's melisma suspends getting to the next word in the, in the psalm or the hymn. But, but it's, you know, it's not done by the same means and it's a different medium and a different art form. So my question is kind of related to that. It comes out of the fact that I am a classically trained musician as well as a poet, and so I've always been kind of interested in the ways of making comparisons between those things. Um, but in thinking about, I guess the question that I want to ask is whether or not there's possibly a fourth category for thinking about time in the way in which you present it um, to us today as case order or duration, because it seems some of the, the poems that leave me most speechless and most um, unable to sort of work out the ways in which they're arriving at a temporal effect have to do with the fact that rather than presenting an event or a resolution in a way that say music must because music can only arrive within a time signature um, by means of resolution or conclusion sometimes you finish a poem and realize that the event that you've been waiting for has already occurred but that, re that recognition only happens after the utterance has already happened. So it happens, I guess, as a result of a kind of reverberation, as opposed to something that's intrinsically present within, say, the oral or the narrative content of the poem itself. Um, like, to think of an example, I was, a few of us actually were in a class where we were looking at a, a just a new -ish poem called An Encounter, which is a very short, kind of perfect lyric poem in which um, two men are in a cart setting out in the early morning. A hare runs across the road. A man raises his hand at the same time. And then the poem makes this jump after this very objective description of what happens to saying, oh my love, where are they now? The hand, the man who raised it, the rabbit, they're all gone. And you sort of realize that this thing that was setting you up for an event was the event, and that, but that event is not contained in either the temporality of the after or in the temporality of the event that was recounted. It's kind of this third thing. And so that's not a very well articulated question, but I guess I was wondering if there's a, a way in which, within the schema, it doesn't seem to fit out of duration, because duration sort of implies a preconceived notion of a box of time that needs to be filled. Like in music, does not measure? And if any time is taken out of that, it's literally called rubato, robbed time. And poem doesn't have that sense. It has a plenitude even when time is not. I, I didn't mean my um, subtitle to indicate categories that were exhaustive. But it seems to me that um, if you include the order of what happens in the poem, uh, if you include in that the, the thing that is elided, the blank line, if you will. Maybe there is no blank line in the Milish poem, but there's a sort of skip. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that the poem is about what happened in the gap. <clears throat> I mean, you could conceive of that as, I mean, he has ordered his 
<clears throat> he has deployed certain things in the poem in a certain order, and he has intentionally skipped something. Mm -hmm. well, this is related to Lisa's question about narrative. <coughs> well, yes, but I think that the the effect um, in the poem is different from um, the relation of the narrative time to narrative event in the in the fiction. You might say that that um, <clears throat> In analyzing fiction, you cannot overlook elements that are uh, not merely sentences or words. There, there are other building blocks in fiction. And in lyric poetry, uh, it is an utterance in which the emphasis is on the language and the sentences and what they do. And I think that um, order might cover Elision in that sense. Yes. I think this is maybe obliquely related. Um, it's kind of an abstract question. Um, but what struck me about your talk and your kind of take on translation was how abstract it is in what I thought was a really interesting way. You know, I, I've never heard a translator talk about trying to capture the sense of time in a poem. They have usually heard people talk about trying to get the cadences or the subject matter across, or you know, there are different kind of kind of fidelity that I'm accustomed to hearing. I thought it was interesting to, to think about it in that kind of uh, well abstract kind of way. But um, one term that kind of returned throughout the talk was uh, was virtual time. That mm -hmm. the poem is presenting us with a kind of virtual time, mm -hmm. which made me curious about what um, what role real time uh, might play in, in what you're getting at uh, because the you know the Iliad you know doesn't take as long to read as the actual war took right or you know a haiku doesn't take as long to read or it's too short to encompass like the turning of seasons or whatever it might be about but uh, there are moments where, like as John was talking about, uh, certain kind, and you, you talked about it in the James Dickey poem, time starts to kind of pool and it, it, it dilates and contracts. and um, So that kind of sculpting of time, the kind of like virtual time that, that's created in the poem, in the translation, and in the poem, uh, does that correspond? Are you, are you sculpting it towards a sense of some kind of real time that you're measuring it against? Do you see what I mean? Like, in other words, like, the Iliad doesn't take as long to read as the war actually would have taken, but it takes as long to read as it would take to, for someone to think about the war or to process the fact of and, and is, that the, is that the real time that you're getting after the time of cognition or the time of processing or of understanding? Or? Well, obviously, I mean, reading a poem silently takes a certain amount of time that you could measure, and reading it aloud takes a certain amount of time that you could measure, and reading a, any given syllable aloud takes a certain amount of time that you could measure. But um, I think our impressions of time in the poem um, are not of clock time, of, are not of that duration. And, but the question you ask is really one that it seems to me that if I'm wearing a poet's hat, I have to answer differently than if I'm wearing a translator's hat, because um, the poet, if I'm translating a poem, the poet has created these effects and has used various devices to make the poem move in certain ways. And I'm trying to create something equivalent uh, in English. Whereas, um, you know, if it's my poem, I can think about um, how soon do I want to get to 
this event, or how long do I want to delay it? Or indeed, when you're revising a poem, you may be thinking, maybe I should take out these six lines. Um, and that's, um, that's a different process. Uh, by the way, Sculpting in Time, isn't that the title of a book about film by Tarkovsky? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking about him yeah. in real time. Yeah, and he really understands filmmaking. You know. Actually, that was my question. Because so much of what you're talking about, when you talk about virtual time, it seems to me that it's really about the subjective experience of time within the poem and how that affects the reader in a way that all of these things that you're talking about, pace, duration, order, affect the subjective experience of time. And then what I was thinking about beyond painting and beyond music is, is the art of editing. That cinema, to a large extent, derives its effects for manipulating the subjective experience of time on the part of the viewer. And many of the things that you talk about are the things that an editor would do. That, that, that film is really all artifice. Not only are the shots completely created, but they exist in the editing room as discrete elements that can be changed, shortened, alighted, and the experience of an event becomes completely abstracted because it can take, it can be expanded to 15 or 20 times the amount of the event, or a group of events can suddenly be alighted. And, the, the, and there's rhythm, there's pace, I mean, there's the, there's the time in the scene, and there's the way that one scene moves to another. So have you thought about, my question is really, have you thought about the art of cinema editing as another kind of way of thinking about some of these effects? The, as you, I'm sure, are aware, the uh, theoretical framework of film criticism is, shall we say, fraught. <laughs> And um, it's interesting that Langer, writing as long ago as she did, did attempt to address film and put it into her framework at the very end of, of Feeling in Form. I, I just want to remind you that virtual time is not the illusion, the primary illusion that she assigns to lyric poetry. She assigns virtual time to music. Uh, in the sense that music is shaping your perception of time in just the way you mentioned, although it, film is doing many other things at the same time. She says the, that the primary illusion of lyric poetry is virtual memory. And I think that she considers film virtual dream. And um, that's, um, that's interesting to me. Uh, I remember hearing uh, Elaine Scarry talk about dreaming by the book, um, and I had certain objections to, what, who, to her argument in the sense that I felt that she was, um, in a way, uh, selling short the uh, degree to which the text um, carries other elements than visual ones upon which one can construct one's own uh, image. Well, this, this, I should probably uh, take the advantage of being the sort of master of ceremonies to say this not to be the last right. question or remark, but um, I've had you know, very little uh, experience with translating, but some with, uh, with editing. And um, so this is really another one of these sort of non-question questions, just sort of how do you how do you think about it? So that, for instance, uh, in, in working with the text of King Lear, which is what I work with most, um, you have two texts, one of which is virtually unpunctuated. The Cordo, it's just a mess, and the verse is not lineated, and you can figure out, you, you have to decide what to do with it, where the line breaks are, what, what the punctuation is. And then you have an edited version very early on, the folio, where these guys, whoever edited the folio, were punctuation maniacs. And they punctuated as heavily as they possibly could. And there are semicolons and, and parentheses. And, and so as a sort of monitor, you said, well, what am I supposed to do here? We had one text that had virtually no punctuation. One text that punctuated the hell out of the thing, but might be sort of interrupted by over-punctuating. So my question is sort of, well, how do you decide? Is, is it just um, 
do you decide mainly by, uh, I mean, it's sort of like a translation question. I mean, do you start to decide by trying to sort of hear the rhythm of the thing and then decide on the punctuation? Or do you feel that, that you go for the meaning first and try to sort of, because there are many, I have to say, in, you know, in, in doing an edition of the Corridor of Lear, there were many times when I just really didn't know whether I should have a semicolon, a period, a comma, no punctuation. So anyway, I'm just sort of, this is a kind of hands-on question. This is why it's uh, a famous saying that no translation is ever finished. Um, I have tried to stick fairly close to um, my originals, but so you actually the advantage of originals that are punctuated by the author. Yes, but actually, <laughs> uh, actually, this issue for the translator, at least in my experience, arises more in translating prose than in translating uh, poetry. I'll give you an example. Um, in a language like German or Norwegian, an introductory element in the sentence will cause the subject and the verb to be inverted when you come to the main clause, come to the predicate. This means that the native speaker will see immediately where the introductory element ends. But in English, that may be ambiguous or unclear unless you put in a comma. So there you have an instance where there's no comma in the original, but there's a syntactic element that serves a certain function. And to serve that function in English, if you want to do it, if you feel it's important, then you're going to put the comma in. Obviously, there's a stylistic decision, as there is when you're writing English, uh, and you know that commas have tended to disappear, and that a uh, hundred years ago you would see them after every introductory phrase, and now you don't see them after short ones. And you, if it's a subordinate clause, you get it. But uh, you may or may not get a comma after an opening phrase um, that is five or six words long, sort of on the borderline between short and long. And that may depend on the author's style and how he wants you to, to read it. So. <clears throat> I think that, yes, the translator has to make similar decisions, and, but it's not as hard as I think when you're editing uh, manuscripts in different conditions like those, because I'm usually dealing with one reliable text, and uh, if I'm deciding that I have to leave out or put in a punctuation mark, it's because I have a reason. It's because of something that I observe happening that the native speaker would notice and that may be lost if I don't punctuate. So it's, it's I think, not as difficult a task as the one that you were referring to. Okay, well, let's thank Roger for really thoughtful. Thank you very much.